Here I've got a classic hard integral problem. And by that I mean we're just going to evaluate an integral that looks pretty gnarly. Okay, so let's see what we've got. We have the integral from 0 to pi over 2 of the natural log of sine of x times the natural log of cosine of x over tangent of x dx. So we're going to start with the substitution. And the substitution becomes a lot more obvious if we take this dx over tangent x term and rewrite it as cotangent of x dx. Now if we take the antiderivative of both parts of this, we'll see that the antiderivative of cotangent is the natural log of sine of x. So you can see that just like by standard u substitution. So we're doing a super hard integral here. So something like that should be kind of second nature when we're approaching something this gnarly. Okay, so that sets us up for our substitution. So here I'll set y equal to the natural log of sine of x. And then by this argument up here, which I have in yellow, we see that dy is equal to dx over tangent of x. So that's really good. Notice that this guy right here will be gobbled up by my dy term. And then this guy right here will be gobbled up by my y term. So all that's left is to determine what's going on with this thing that I've overbraced in green. So let's put a little green box down here to do this calculation. So let's start with this equation and maybe see if we can solve for sine of x and then use maybe a trig identity or something. I can exponentiate this equation. And that'll give me e to the y is equal to sine of x. Okay, then from here, I can square both sides. That'll give me e to the 2y is equal to sine squared of x. But where can I go from there? Well, let's recall the very well-known Pythagorean trigonometric identity it says that this is equal to 1 minus cosine squared of x. So that means we've got cosine squared of x is equal to 1 minus e to the 2y, just by solving for cosine squared. But now I can take the square root of both sides. That would involve putting this to the half power, and then I can just like erase that cosine squared, and then take the natural log of both sides, and I see that the natural log of cosine of x, using log rules, is 1 half 1 1 half times the natural log of 1 minus e to the 2y, where I used, again, like I said, natural log rules to bring this half out front. Okay, so let's bring that up here and notice that now we have this is 1 half natural log of 1 minus e to the 2y. So that allows us to rewrite this instead of an integral having to do with x as an integral having to do with y. So let's do exactly that. We'll have the integral of, well, I'm going to bring this half out front from this term right here. And then we'll have y times the natural log of 1 minus e to the 2y dy. Now next up is we need to figure out the bounds of integration. So let's notice when x is equal to 0, then y is equal to the natural log of 0, which actually doesn't make any sense. So we want to think about x approaching 0 from above, and that would make y approach negative infinity. Great. And then as x goes to pi over 2, we get the natural log of 1, which is 0. So now this is going to be the integral from minus infinity to 0. Okay. But now, like, this term right here is a little bit problematic, this natural log of 1 minus e to the 2y. And I think maybe a nice way to simplify that is to turn it into a double integral. So let's see. We'll have 1 half and then the integral from minus infinity to 0 of y, and then the integral from 0 up to e to the 2y of minus 1 over 1 minus z dz dy. So let's talk our way through that. 
if we were to take the antiderivative of this term right here, we would get the natural log of one minus z. Then we evaluate that at e to the two y, that gives us this term, evaluate that at zero and we'll get zero. So that looks pretty good. Okay, now where can we go from there? Maybe I'll slam these two integrals together into a double integral. So I'll have one half, and then the integral from minus infinity to zero, the integral from zero to e to the two y of y over one minus z. Let's go ahead and take this minus sign outside as well. And then I have dz dy. Now what should I do here? Well, changing the bounds of integration would be one possibility, but since this inner bound of integration has a function of y in the top bound, that might be a little bit tricky. Well, obviously we don't wanna take the antiderivative with respect to z because then we'd be right back here. So what we'll do instead is notice that this object right here looks a lot like a summed geometric series in terms of z. So let's expand that as a geometric series. So that's gonna give us the following. And now I'm gonna like use a bit of a trick, which is sometimes a cheat, but it works in this case. And that is I'll exchange the order of summation and integration. So I've got the sum as m goes from zero up to infinity of the double integral minus infinity to zero and then zero to e to the two y of y times z to the m, and then we have dz dy, like that. Okay, so just to reiterate, summing over m from zero to infinity of z to the m will give us one over one minus z, because again, that's a geometric series. Okay, so now let's take the antiderivative of that with respect to z and see what happens. We have minus half, and then the sum as m goes from zero up to infinity of the integral from minus infinity to zero of y times z to the m plus one over m plus one. We need to evaluate that from zero up to e to the two y, and then we've got our dy on the outside. So that was from doing this inner integral with respect to z. So now I'm gonna re-index a little bit just so this looks a little nicer. Instead of starting at m equals zero, I'm gonna start at m equals one. And that means instead of having z to the m plus one and m plus one, we'll just have z to the m and m. Okay, so let's see what that leaves us with. We have minus half and then my sum as m goes from one up to infinity of the integral from minus infinity to zero of y times e to the two m y dy. And that's all over m. Where I just keep in mind because of exponent rules, when I raise e to the two y to the nth power, I multiply the exponents. Okay, so let's maybe bring this right here and we'll finish it off. Okay, so where are we so far? We've taken our original goal integral and rewritten it as minus half times the sum as m goes from one to infinity of one over m, and then the integral from minus infinity to zero of y e to the two m y dy. So I've rewritten that a little bit from what we saw on the last board. I really just factored this one over m out of the integral, but that's kind of obvious because one over m is a constant with respect to the integral. Now we look at this guy right here and notice that it is a integral of the form a polynomial times a transcendental function. So an exponential function you can think of as one type of a transcendental function. And so that means that we should probably use integration by parts. And in fact, these type of integration by parts problems work very well with tabular integration or the DI method if you watch black pin, red pins videos. So here you'll put the polynomial on the left and the exponential on the right. You'll take derivatives down the left column and 
antiderivatives down the right column. Just to point out, what we're trying to do here is calculate the antiderivative of y e to the 2my dy. Okay, so taking derivatives here, we'll get 1 and then 0. Then we can stop. Taking antiderivatives here, we get 1 over 2m e to the 2my, and then 1 over 4m squared e to the 2my. Well, we match things on the diagonals, so we'll match y with that term, 1 with that term, and then we'll alternate the sums like that. And then what this tells us is that this integral right here, or this antiderivative right here, is equal to y over 2m e to the 2my minus 1 over 4m squared e to the 2my. Great. So now we can insert that into what we've got so far. So that's going to give us minus half, and then we have the sum as m goes from 1 up to infinity of 1 over m, and then inside that sum, we've got this integral evaluated. So that's going to be y over 2m e to the 2my, where we need to evaluate that from minus infinity to zero, keeping in mind that this minus infinity is going to involve a limit. And then minus 1 over 4m squared e to the 2my from minus infinity to zero, like that. So now let's notice that this first thing actually simplifies quite a bit. If we plug zero into this, we get zero times e to the zero. e to the zero is one, so that's gonna cancel out from the upper bound. If we plug in minus infinity, what I really mean is we take the limit as y approaches minus infinity. Well, the exponential term is gonna win out and it's gonna give us zero. e to the minus infinity is zero. So that means we get zero for all of this. Now next, if we plug zero in here, we'll get one. That's because e to the zero is one. Then if we let y approach minus infinity, we'll get zero. So that tells us that this is going to become minus one over four m squared. Just from the upper bound, we don't get anything from the lower bound. Okay, so now let's put all of this together. We can take this minus quarter out. That'll give us a positive eighth on the outside. And then we have the sum as m goes from one up to infinity of one over m times one over m squared. So that's one over m cubed. But that's exactly one over eight times the Riemann zeta function evaluated at three. And you may be a little bummed out about this because our final answer is in terms of an infinite sum, but these odd values of the Riemann zeta function are actually very important. And in fact, there's a big conjecture that says that these odd values of the Riemann zeta function are algebraically independent of other well-known transcendental numbers like e and pi and so on and so forth. So you should almost think about these as playing those type of roles in our arithmetic. Okay, so anyway, we finished it off. The value of our goal integral is equal to this 1 8 zeta of three. And that's a good place to stop.